Well, um, would you just help me say thank you again to the choir and everybody that worked so hard to just get this ministry started again? I appreciate that. I, uh, it, it is a rough deal to go from zero all the way back to things, and I just thought they just, you just did a beautiful job. Thank you for the blessing of that. That was great. We, that's super. All right. Well, today uh, is the final message in our series on uh, running our race. Oh, I lost my OCC tags. That's all right. We've already bought the stuff. <laughs> um, today we're going to be talking about the conclusion. This is a three-part series, uh, and if you've been here, um, we have already gone through the first two parts, and we'll have a quick moment of review uh, as we get into it today. Uh, but I, to, this morning we're going to finish this series, uh, Lord willing. <laughs> The new people don't know why that's funny. Um, so we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, you've already stood for the reading of it. I won't ask you to stand again. I want you to just read it along with me here. I'm going to offer a thought, and then we'll pray. We'll jump with both feet into the message, and, and we'll get going. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse number 24, it says like this. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize just like to remind you this morning that when you get saved, your race of your Christian life begins. And everybody is running. But just running in the race does not mean that you're going to win a prize. This is not a race that is competitive with the other runners. It's a race that's competitive with yourself. The person you need to beat <laughs> to win this prize is you. The Bible says, know you not that they all run, but only one receiveth the prize. So run that you might obtain. In other words, run to get that prize. Now this morning, the message is on, we talked about running with the end in mind, running with a thought about what is that prize? What are you running for? What does the joy at the end of your race look like? And what does it not look like? What things do you want the end of your race to not look like? And then we talked about temperance last Sunday. That's in verse 25. It says, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. We talked about what temperance is, and we'll review that in a moment. But finally, this morning, we want to understand the idea of patience. Where does patience come into this? At first reading, it's maybe not obvious here in our text where the patience is. But it's actually woven throughout the text I don't intend to turn this into a grammar lesson this morning, but, but uh, Greek has some more tenses and tones uh, than the English language does. I just want to draw your attention to one thing quickly this morning. There in verse 24, in the first verse, it says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receiveth the prize, so run. That word run there is, what, is in what they call the present active imperative tense. There will not be a quiz on this later. I'm telling you that what that means is that it is a current and ongoing action. This is not the word here. The idea of so run is to run and keep running. I would suggest to you this morning that that requires patience. The Christian life is not a sprint. You're not going to get up one day and you're going to accomplish all the things in your Christian life and then you're done and there's nothing but to do but find a beach somewhere in some pina coladas. <laughs> there is a great retirement coming. There is a great retirement coming. But you've got to cross the finish line first. The first time I ever ran Bloomsday, if you're new to Spokane, you may not know, especially if you moved here in the last year, they didn't do it last year. <laughs> uh, I don't know if they'll do it this year either. We'll see if it's coming here, but in any case, so it's a big, it's a big race through downtown. And the first year I ever did it, I haven't done it in years, but the first time I did it, I was young. I was a young man back then. You just imagine me with darker hair. <laughs> and, and I was just there for the party of it. Like I knew there was a t-shirt at the end, but I knew I wasn't going to get a time that I was going to brag about. So, you know, so I was in one of the back blocks and they kind of, they finally started us. And so I was like, you know, 
And I ran for parts of it, and I strolled for parts of it. It goes right by Doyle's ice cream. I stopped. I sat there, and I ate some ice cream with a couple of my buddies and watched the runners go by. Started running again. I don't necessarily recommend this strategy. And I don't remember what my time was. I got a t-shirt, but that was it. And that was fine. But that's not what's in mind here. If that's, that's the approach, unfortunately, that a lot of Christians do take to their life. A lot of people take that approach to their life. The admonition from the scriptures is that you're in a race. Run to win something. Run to get a prize. To do that, you're going to have to not just run once or for a little bit. You're going to have to keep on running. If we're going to succeed at this, it's going to require patience. All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together this morning. We thank you for this scripture. Lord, this is our third Sunday looking at this text, and there's a lot here. Lord, I am really grateful for the ways that you have spoken to my heart on this subject, even just this past week. God, thank you for your patience with me. I don't feel like I'm probably the best person to deliver this message. But I'm willing to try. God, would you please help me? These are your people. They've come to hear from you. And I believe every person here needs this message. There's something that everyone here is struggling with. And we need patience. And Lord, many like me are really bad at being patient. Please help. Please help us to see this truth and not just to understand it, but to take it in. Down into the deep places, God, where it might work to change us. That today we would not just learn some interesting things. But today we would be made more like you, that you would teach us to be more patient. Only you can do that work in the way that it needs to be done. So we just turn the service over to you. God, please do whatever you'd like to. Give us soft hearts, and ready minds. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to admit at the start of this message that patience is not my favorite Christian virtue. It would be, might be fair to say it's my least <laughs> favorite. I am also not great at that. Part of my uh, being patient, part of my reason for telling you that is so that I will hopefully feel like less of a hypocrite as I preach to you on this subject of patience. I would like to say that this week, um, I went through a couple of trials that... <laughs> As I was preparing the message, I was like, oh, this message is for me. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I believe that there's some things in here that will be, they, 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 and it was, here's the good news. This message helped me. I feel like pretty confident this is a helpful message because it already helped me. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's, it's nice if every so often mom or dad takes a bite of that baby food before they try to shove it in your mouth, huh? Like, like you, you take a bite of that first and see what you think. And I just want to say, I know it's split pea, but it's, it's, it's all right. It's pretty good. All right. <laughs> if you've got your bulletin this morning and you'd like to fill in some blanks as we go along, I'd invite you to do that. Or, of course, just listen. This first part is just review. We'll do it kind of quickly. If, if we go over anything real fast and you missed it, I'll remind you that all of this is available um, on the internet, on our church website. You can get the whole message available. You can get a couple hours worth of preaching on this subject <laughs> if you would like it. Here it is. The first thing I'd like to say, I'd like to remind you, is that the Christian life is like a race. The Bible uses this metaphor a lot, and there are many ways in which the Christian life is like a race. It has a very clear start when you get saved. It has a very clear finish line goal. 
That is to reach heaven, and when we get there, to be like Jesus. I want you to know this too, that God has promised to complete the work that he began in you. God, he who began a good work in you, will complete it. And so the goal, I mean, Jesus will drag you across the finish line, I believe. But the goal is to not have to have him do that. The goal is to make progress towards being like Jesus so that there's less dragging to do at the end. But that's the goal. That is the goal of the Christian life, is to be like him. The Christian life is also like a race because it has a time limit. Time is continually ticking away. Your life, your Christian race, will only go on so long and then it's done. There, in heaven, there will not be any further opportunity to complete that race. Pastor Asbury said once, and when he first said it, I didn't believe him. And when I say it to you, you may not believe me. But if you think about this, you might change your mind like I did. Pastor Tom said he thought that every single person in heaven, if given the opportunity, would come back here to take another year. And I thought, not me. Once I get out of here, I am not coming back. Have you seen here? As I've gotten older, I thought, you know what? I think that's right. Because there's no more chance to go soul winning. There's no more chance to feed a hungry person. There's no more chance to take care of an orphan or a widow in heaven. They don't have those there. And that's good news. But if you want a chance to do something for lost and broken and needy people, now's your chance. There's a time limit. There's spectators. People are watching how we live our lives. They're watching the way that we treat each other. They're watching the way we treat our kids. They're watching the way we interact with our community. People are watching the way you run your race. The Christian life is like a race because it has rules and a judge and individual prizes. This is not a stroll on the beach. It's not a hike through the woods where you can just wander off if you want to. If you try to take a shortcut, if you disobey the rules, if you don't follow the procedures, you will be disqualified. The Bible warns us that we could be a dakamas. We could be cast away on our own race, disqualified at the end. There's a judge, Jesus Christ, who will award prizes at the end. I want you to know that if you're saved... That on the old rugged cross of Calvary, Jesus paid for every single thing you've ever done wrong, for every wicked thought, for every wicked word, for every sin you've ever committed. They're all paid for by Jesus Christ the moment you get saved. But there are still prizes for the good things, for, that, for the things in which you obey Christ and follow him and do what he said. There are rewards for that. And Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, is going to hand out those individual prizes. They're individual because you are an individual. God did not make you like every other Christian. When you got saved, Jesus did not stamp you into the same generic Christian image. He made you a unique individual. You have a unique gift. You have a unique ministry, and you will be judged on how you do, not running my race or the race of the person sitting next to you, but your race. The Bible says we have gifts in Romans 12, gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us. In 2 Timothy 2, 5, if a man strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned. I think I'm going to show you a picture of my kid again. Yep, masteries. <laughs> uh, in, in, in his jiu-jitsu class, it's... it's you put in the work, you learn the skills, you get the stripes on your belt. Eventually you get, he's going to promote to a gray belt this week. I'm super excited about it. We're, so I get to go watch him get his gray belt. It's a mastery. And I, you might recall, I told you I want to be a black belt pastor. That's, that's my goal. I want to, I want to master my gift and get good at the things that God has gifted me for and called me towards. But if you want to be the masteries, you've got to follow the rules. You've got to do it God's way. The Bible says he's not crowned unless he strive lawfully. So the Christian life is like a race. And since it's like a race, you should run it hard enough to win your prize. Are you running your race hard enough to win whatever your prize is? In Philippians 3.14, the Bible says, I press, I dioko, I DK Metcalf towards the prize. If you don't get that joke, you have to get the sermon last Sunday. 
It says, I'm pressing towards the mark. I'm, I'm not just running. I'm chasing it down. I'm running to catch it. I am not going to let any, I'm not going to let it get away from me. I'm going to run until I get it. I'm pressing Dioko towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Are you, are you running to catch it? Then last Sunday we said that to run victoriously, if, we're, if we know what that prize is at the end and we want to catch it to run victoriously, we must develop temperance. We must develop temperance. And what is temperance? We defined it last Sunday as self-controlled athletic preparation, mastery of the self. The Greek word there that's translated as temperate and temperance literally means athletic preparation. It's, it's a mastery of something, but to particularly mastery of yourself. To be able to say yes to some things and no to others and for you to decide, not just your appetites to decide. True temperance is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit because it is a fruit of the Spirit. Temperance is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, even, even athletes and people that we admire their athletic preparation, we admire their temperance in certain areas are not temperate in most areas. They, they, they maybe have incredible control over their bodies and they're able to do these incredible athletic feats, but they are not well in control of their lives generally in almost any other area. Their finances are out of control. Their marriage and relationships are out of control. Their substance abuse or things like that, out of control, emotionally out of control. If you want to have true temperance, not just in a single narrow area, but if you want to have a life that is characterized by temperance, by that athletic self-control, that is a fruit of the Spirit. And you cannot get it without the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot try harder to be temperate. It only comes from walking with the Lord. You have to be reading your Bible. You got to be praying. You got to be hearing the preaching. You got to be walking with God. And then God produces the fruit of temperance in your life. Te true temperance is saying no to yourself because, because you are saying yes to the victorious Christian life. You cannot, I, don't, I do not believe you can succeed at the Christian life with just a long list of no's. Some churches and some Christians make this mistake where they have developed a very long list of don't. Now, how many of you understand that if we're going to be a Christian, there is a list of don't? I, need, I mean, listen, you need, some churches have gone the other way and just like do whatever you want. That's a recipe for disaster. And some of you know that firsthand. But listen, you can't get there with just no either. The victorious Christian life, we say yes to that. Yes to following Jesus. Yes to being like him. Yes to growing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And when you are excited to have the fruits of the Spirit of God, when you're excited for Jesus to do something with your life, when you're excited that your life is going to matter... Then the other things is like, who cares about that stuff? It's not like, oh, I'm so sad I'm missing it. That goes away. I mean, it's really cool because sometimes it's really hard to let some of those things go. But those things, compared to the yes that you have, it's garbage anyway. And so, Christian, I just want to say, get excited about what you're saying yes to. That's why we started with what does the prize look like? What, what, what are you saying yes to? I am excited to have a good marriage. Heather and I, we, we, we laugh sometimes about, like, that we'd never, we, we, you know, like we'd never cheat on each other. And we say that, and, and like, <laughs> we say, I said, frankly, I can't imagine finding the energy for that. <laughs> the, the sneaking around and extra appointments on my schedule and... <laughs> I mean, that sounds exhausting. I mean, also, I love you, but who has the time? Now, that's an awful thing to say. <laughs> I, I, I think you all know where to file that. Somebody just say amen. But here's the, here's the real trick. Here's the real secret to it, though. Is I, I am saying yes to, to my wife and to my marriage, and I am excited about what only God, not only what God is doing in that relationship right now, but what I'm excited to see what we're going to be like in 20 years. 
I, I, I wouldn't miss that for... Like, what am I going to give that up for? I'm excited about the yes, and it makes the no's easy. Easier. Okay. Running with temperance for my personal prizes. So this, was, this is sort of where we ended last week, about thinking about our personal prizes. And here's the series of questions. You know, if, hopefully you've done this. If you've done the work on this already, then you're up to speed. If not, I challenge you to take some time this week to catch up and do this work if you've not done it. And, and the work is this, to answer these questions. To finish my race with joy about my gift, what must you be diligent about? God's given you a gift. You have one. The Bible says you have one. If you're saved, you have a gift on the authority of the word of God, at least one. Many of you have two or three. You get some of those obnoxious people that have like four gifts. <laughs> Seems unfair, right? But, but they have a greater responsibility too. There's more things to be diligent about if you've got that many gifts. But what's yours? And whatever your gift is, what do you need to be diligent about so that there's joy at the end of your race about your gift? I shared with you some of mine. I have to be diligent about my sermon prep time. I have a gift for preaching. I, be, I believe that I do. You may disagree at the end of this message, but, <laughs> but, but, but I think that's something the Lord's equipped me to do. And I'm not, I'm not using my gift to make money. I'm not using my gift to get famous. I'm not using my gift for any of that sort of stuff. I'm using it to proclaim the gospel, to teach the Bible. That's what I'm using it for. And I want to finish that with joy. What does that mean? For me, it means I'm diligent about my sermon prep time. I've made a commitment to never download a sermon off the internet. You might be stunned to know how many pastors do that. And I understand it. I can get up here and get self-righteous and stomp my foot, and Lord knows I do that. But I'm telling you, being a pastor is overwhelming. It's exhausting. There's so many things that clamor for a pastor's attention. But I've made a commitment that to finish my race with joy about the work that I did, every sermon is not going to be great. Almost none of them will finish on time. You don't believe this, but I try. You don't want to see what would happen if I quit trying. They're not all going to be winners. I go home discouraged a lot of Sundays. Things don't come out the way I planned them or the way I thought they should. Or I go home and I think, oh, I missed the obvious thing or whatever. But I'll tell you what, the joy doesn't come from that anyway. The joy comes from knowing that I was diligent about following the Lord and keeping after it. And that's what I want. So I'm diligent about my sermon prep time. I'm diligent about my prayer time before I preach. I make sure that I've got lots of prayer time stacked in there. A lot of time, I mean, I run, I never really finish a sermon. I just run out of time and then it's Sunday. <laughs> and so, but one of the things I learned I had to be diligent about was not skimping on the prayer time in order to get more sermon prep time. The sermon... I believe succeeds or fails in proportion to my dependence on Jesus Christ. And so I've got to be diligent about my dependence on the Lord. What do you need to do to finish your race with joy about your gift? What do you need to be diligent about? What about your ministry? What do you need to finish with joy about your ministry? Every Christian's got a ministry too. You've got a gift and then you've got a ministry. Some of it's official ministry, some of it's informal. Some of it might be with your family or in the community. A lot of it will be at church. What is it? And what do you need to be diligent about to finish it with joy? What about your family? What do you need to be diligent about to finish your race with joy with your family? For me, one of the things is date night. We are religious about date night. I mean, I, I can't think of the last time we missed a date night. Sometimes it's got to move. If, if it doesn't work out on Tuesday night, it moves to a different night of the week. Some of you, I got a text message uh, from, from John uh, Tuesday afternoon, said, enjoy your date night, pastor. And I did. <laughs> and not just because he said so. I love date night. It's the only time my wife and I talk. <laughs> That's not quite true, but it's <sighs> focused time with the kids. Not just being around the kids, but being with the kids and paying attention to them. What do you need to be diligent about if you want to finish with joy about your family? What do you need to be diligent about to finish with joy about your testimony? Those long-term relationships, that getting some godly counsel, 
those daily devotions. What, ought you, what do you need to be diligent about if you want to finish with a joy about the testimony you had? That when people come to your funeral, if the Lord tarries that long, and say things about you, what do you want your testimony to be? You should know what that looks like. And then knowing what it looks like and what you don't want it to look like, then you translate that into, what do I need to be diligent about doing now so that it will look like that and it won't look like that? And those are the first two messages that we preached. All right. Today, we're going to say this. The victorious Christian life must be run with patience. With patience. Hopefully, if you've been following along, if you've been putting the work in, and you'll get more out of the series if you've done that, and you know what the end looks like, you know what the joy looks like at the end, and you've, made, and you've got some ideas about the diligent things you need to be tempered about, the things you need to be committed to, now I want to say this to you about those things that you've thought of. Be patient. Be patient as you run the race. The end of your race may not yet even be in sight. Second Peter 1 is in your bulletin there and has a very interesting progression. This is a whole sermon, and I'm only going to preach part of it to you. First Peter 1, beginning in verse 5, puts it like this. Besides all this, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue. The Christian life begins with faith. Somebody say amen. When you put your faith and your trust into Jesus Christ, you are born again into God's family. You are washed in the blood of Christ. You are made a new creature. You are reserved a place in heaven with God. It's a wonderful thing, and it happens the moment you put your faith into Christ. The Bible says that we ought to be diligent then to, to your faith. You ought to add some virtue. You know what virtue is? Virtue is doing the right things. Listen, what a shame it is that there are so many Christians with so little virtue. When you get saved, it ought to change your life. Your life ought to look different because you're a Christian than it would look if you were not a Christian. That ought to be our testimony. To our faith, we ought to add virtue. But then look what it says next. To virtue, knowledge. Because here's the part of the problem. We don't always know what we even ought to do. We don't even always know what the right, how do you handle this situation? Or, or, or even when you do know it, sometimes you don't know how to do it. I, I, I've been talking to my dad about an issue here uh, in my life where there's this, I, I know I need to forgive this person and I have forgiven this person, but, I, but he preached this awful, awful message at 915 <laughs> on forgiveness. It was horrible. I was so convicted through the whole thing. Because one of the things he says is that like when you've really forgiven somebody, you ought to be okay in the same room with them. And I thought, pass. I've forgiven them, just don't make me be around them. And so it occurred to me from the word of God that there's a little bit further that forgiveness needs to go. But the Lord's been working on my heart since then. I added a little bit of knowledge there about this is actually what Christian forgiveness looks like. Now, I got the part where you're not supposed to be bitter. Some, some people never get that. I knew that already. That's good. Don't be bitter. Bitterness is drinking poison and hoping the other person gets sick. Don't get bitter. Like, I, I worked that one out. That's good. But there's a little more knowledge I needed. And so Elder Don, through the scriptures, my dad, helping me with that. To your virtue, you need to add some knowledge. But then it says, to knowledge, look at what the Bible says. To knowledge, add temperance. What's that mean? That means we need to get some self-control over it. Because now when those thoughts come up and those ideas come up, I've got to get control of those things. Now I know that that's wrong. Now I need to get control of it. To knowledge, temperance. Y'all with me so far? Then what's the Bible say? To temperance, uh-oh, patience. And all God's people said, boo, patience. You know what patience means? We're going to talk about it more in a minute. Patience means it's not going to happen right away. Sometimes when you say try to forgive somebody, one try is not going to be enough. You might have to keep at that for a while. It might take a minute.
So to faith, virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. You can see the things that come next after patience. It's godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. That's phileo, love. And to brotherly kindness, charity. That's agape, love. You might recall that now three things remain. Faith, hope, and charity. Agape, love. But the greatest of these is that agape, love. That's the goal. But Patience is right there in the middle. But the Bible says this about it. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know how I read that? If you do this, there's a prize. There's a harvest. You want to run a victorious Christian life? You want to have a, a life that bore fruit and that produced something of eternal value? This is how you do it. Faith, knowledge, temperance, patience. And on that road, there's godliness and brotherly love and agape love. All right. So let's try to define some patience together this morning. Running with patience. What does the Bible say about patience? I warn you now, you are not going to enjoy it. No, <laughs> Now, this is all right. This is good stuff. I, I, this, is, this is helpful. I, I believe it is. What does the Bible say about patience? Patience in the Greek is hupomene. Hupomene is the word that's most commonly translated as patience. And it means this, steadfastness in waiting. It's waiting. Patience is waiting. And it's waiting in a solid, fixed way. It's constancy, endurance, or perseverance. But it is those things in waiting. James Strong, I, you know, I, I use my Strong's Concordance all the time. I've never quoted directly from him before this sermon. Uh, but Strong wrote Strong's Concordance when he was defining patience as a little aside. This is what he put, and I, I thought it was really great. He said, patience is not swerved from a deliberate purpose and loyalty by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Patience is not deterred when it's made a decision about some purpose or loyalty. No trial, no suffering alters the equation. That's what patience is. It's saying, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Patience, I would say to you this morning, is confident waiting. We could define patience as confident waiting. Hupomene, the steadfastness in waiting, it's not real biblical patience. It's not just waiting for something that might happen. I've been very burned by patience in my life. Part of the reason I struggle with this because I feel that there have been many things in my life that I have patiently waited for only to be ultimately disappointed by those things. I mean, like definitively disappointed. The answer turned out to be no. Not like not now, not wait, no. And those no's are hard. And I personally by some of the no's, especially with my daughter. We have some guests this morning. I have, a, I have a special needs daughter, and she suffers enormously. And some of the no's on that have been very, very difficult. And I thought, you know, I was really patient waiting for the Lord to answer this. And it was a mistake. Patience and hope are deeply connected topics. A couple years ago, I preached a series of messages on hope. Uh, some of you may recall some of that. The words even are sometimes even interchangeably translated in the scriptures. Hope and patience are so, they're two sides of one coin. Sometimes I express that as I'm very damaged about hope. 
But here's the thing. Not everything you hope for is worthy of your hope. You shouldn't be hoping for that. Some things we hope in do, in fact, disappoint. And here's the other thing about patience. Some things you are patiently waiting for, you probably shouldn't be waiting for them. Hupabane, biblical patience, is not those things. It's different than that because it is a confident waiting. It's not a waiting saying, I wonder if it'll happen. This kind of patience is not a, I hope it will happen. This is the kind of patience that says, I am waiting for it to happen. Romans 8 puts it like this. It's there in your outline. For we are saved by hope. But hope that's seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Biblical patience is connected to biblical hope. I warned you, these two are the same thing. If we have a hope for it, then you can patiently, confidently wait for it to happen. So what are we waiting for? What are we hoping for? Here it is. Patience is confident waiting for Christ. I have waited for things that I have been disappointed about. I have had hope in things that I have been deeply disappointed about. I have never yet waited for Christ and been disappointed. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5 says, The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. I don't know what you're hoping in this morning. I don't know what you're patiently maybe even trying to wait for. But I'd like to say to you this morning that biblical patience, the, the sort of patience I want to advocate to you this morning, is not just a generalized patience. Maybe we could all do with a little more general patience. That might be true. But that's not what I'm here to preach to you about this morning. I do not believe that's what the Bible has in view here. Specifically, waiting for Christ. Waiting for Jesus to show up. Sometimes when we think about waiting for Jesus, we think about waiting for his return. And that's perfectly appropriate. That 100% applies right here. Waiting for Christ's return. But I do not believe at all that it is restricted to just that. I need Jesus to show up in my marriage. I need Jesus to be there for me when I'm discouraged. I need Jesus' help to take care of my kids. I need his help in getting the sermons ready. I need help in counseling. I need help in all of it. And you have to wait sometimes to perceive the presence of Christ. Now, the Bible says that he will never leave us or forsake us. He is present. But maybe you know, like I do, that it doesn't always feel that way. Do you ever felt like you were just really in it all by yourself? Have you ever looked around and said, where's God? I have. I've been so discouraged. I've not just said, where is God? I've said, I wonder if there is any such person as God. Because if there is, how could he let this happen? Pastor Farouk shared real powerfully a couple weeks ago about so some of the trials as they were refugees and on the run for their lives and all the things that unfolded there, how in the midst of it, 
sitting in prison with his young children and his wife, surrounded by just filth and despair and thinking, it's not obvious where Christ is here. But when he looks back on it now, he says, oh, Jesus was everywhere. <laughs> Sometimes the presence of Christ is not visible until we look back at things. And if you know that's true, could I say this to you? While you're in the middle of it, and you can't see where Jesus is or what he's doing, you can have patience for that. You can confidently wait for the realization that he's there. Because he is. Why? Because the third part of our definition of patience is this. Patience is confidently waiting for Christ because of his promises. We are waiting for Christ. That's what patience is. We are waiting for Christ because he promised. He, he promised it. And Jesus keeps his promises. It's one of the most wonderful things about our Savior. It's one of the most wonderful things about God. He's not the kind of king who makes a promise and then breaks it. He's not the kind of king who gets busy with other things and forgot what he said he would do for you. He hasn't lost track of you. He hasn't gotten occupied somewhere else and forgot that he made a promise. He remembers. He keeps his promises. Every word of his is sure and true and trustworthy. And Christian, we have some incredible promises from Jesus. And if he promised, you can wait for it. The problem is that we wait for things that he didn't promise. And those things don't always come to pass. Hebrews 10 puts it like this. It's in your outline. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. The Bible says, hey, one of the best rewards that you can have, one of the biggest pieces of joy that you can have in your life is your confidence in Christ. Don't lose your confidence in Jesus. Hang on to your confidence, not in yourself, not in the pastor, not your confidence in the church, not your confidence in your family, not your confidence in other people. They can and will disappoint you, but don't, don't lose your confidence in Christ. Don't cast it away. It says, for you have need of patience. We give up on our confidence in Christ. We give up on our belief in his promises. So often simply because we have lost patience. And what is the patience? I want you to notice what the patience specifically is here in Hebrew. It says that you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. That's what we're waiting for. Not for our wish list, not for all our hopes and dreams. We're waiting for the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. We're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting for his promise to be there. For his promise to show up and not abandon us. I'd like to say this to you this morning about patience also. That patience for Christ is always rewarded. It's always rewarded. I've been disappointed by many, many things. And I've felt disappointed in Christ. I have felt disappointed in God. But it always turned out to not be real. And in the end, I had a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost shouting fit because Jesus kept his promises. He always does. James 5.10 says it like this. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken to you in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job. Yeah. But you've seen the end, the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful. It means he's full of pity and tender mercy. Maybe you're in the middle of something real, real tough. <laughs> Consider Job. 
Bible says, consider Job. We count him happy for enduring. You've seen the end of the story. You may not be the end of your story yet, but we know how it ends. It ends with Jesus keeping his promises. And lastly, this I'd like to say to you about what the Bible says about patience. Patience is forged in trials. You don't get better at patience when things are going well. (laughs) Isn't that a bummer? Patience is a crop that does not grow on the mountains. Patience grows down in the valleys. That's where it grows. If you're going to get more patience, you're going to go through trials to get it. It's an odd thing. Frankly, this bothers me. It's like I need the patience for the trials. So like, seems like I should get patience when things are good. So I got a nice little stockpile of it. So that when I go into the valley, we can just go into the pantry and dig out some patience. Doesn't that make more sense? We'll write God a letter and tell him. (laughs) That's not where it grows. You know why? It wouldn't be real. Heather and I talk about this some. All the suffering and things we've been through, we wouldn't wish it on anybody. I wouldn't wish the stuff we've been through on any of you. But I don't want to be the person that I was before I went through it. I don't want to be that person. The person that I've become through that, I like this person better. This one is more like Jesus than the one that hadn't suffered. The Josh Tucker that hadn't suffered much, frankly, between you and me, he was pretty cocky. (laughs) Right from the horse's mouth, right there. He's not picking on me. That's just the truth. I just, you know, I was born on third base and I thought I hit a triple. It's not, it's like, I, I, I mean, how many people get to grow up in an intact family where mom and dad genuinely love each other, going to church, service, never worried about food, I mean, no big calamities in my life, no, no abuse, no real suffering, no real loss. I mean, I had, I had about as good of a childhood as you could possibly imagine. And I contributed nothing to that. And that person that that made me was, I mean, I knew a lot of Bible and, 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 I, and, I, and I loved God and wanted to serve him and stuff. But a lot of it was kind of on my terms. I needed the suffering to learn where the real joy was. I still do. It's possible God knows what he's doing. (laughs) We have to allow it's possible. (laughs) Romans chapter 5 says it like this. Not only so, but we glory in our tribulations also. Because we know that tribulation worketh patience. That worketh there in the Greek, it's katergozomai. It means to fashion or to cause. It's the same word that's used to like fashion a piece of jewelry, right? The katergozomai. It says that the trials, the tribulation fashions patience in us. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. It's not a hope that things are going to work out fine. Things are not always going to work out fine. It's hope that Jesus is going to be there for it. It's hope that we're not abandoned. It's hope that this world is not all there is. It's hope that God keeps each and every single one of his promises. Hope. James 1, 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh, Cater goes in my again, worketh patience. So let patience have her perfect work that you might be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Pastor Paul Chapel said this just at the Spiritual Leadership Conference just a couple weeks ago, and he said you can't have a testimony without a test. All right. So here's the application. This is the end of, the, this, is the end of this message. It's the end of this entire series. 
How do you run your race with patience? Well, you run with the end in mind. Do you know what it looks like? What prize do you want? What's the joy look like? What do you want it to not look like? What things do you for sure want to not have happen? What's the prize? Okay. What do you need to be diligent about to do that? What things do you need to be diligent about doing? What things do you need to be diligent about avoiding? And once you know those things, be patient. Do it. Run. Run. And keep running. Don't quit. I have three thoughts I'd like to give you from the scriptures about how you can grow some patience. This, this first one was of particular help to me just this week. To run our race with patience. First of all, you grow patience by valuing each different season. You're going to go through different seasons in your life. Some of the seasons we like better than others. Some seasons, it's easy to see the value of harvest. We understand the value of harvest. No problem. Got it. Winter. We grow patience by valuing each different season. To recognize that each season has value and it has purpose and that we ought to embrace it as being useful. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not. The thing about harvest is it comes after winter and after spring and after summer. Don't quit in spring, you'll never get to harvest. Don't quit in winter, you'll never get to harvest. Don't quit in the summer, you'll never get to harvest. Patience. Harvest is coming. You don't faint. I was thinking about this some, um, and I thought about the winter season. Winter's quiet, barren. Maybe there's some part of your life that's winter. I'll say this too. I think different aspects of your life can be in different seasons at the same time. You might have some part that's in this season and some part that's in that season. Although I found that in my life, broadly, one season is like the most prevalent, even though there's some other things happening. Winter is a quiet and barren season. Don't be discouraged. It's not useless. It's not purposeless to be in a winter season. If you're in winter, I'd like to challenge you to patiently plan. Prepare. Winter's a good time for planning because there's not much going on. There's not a lot happening. This church was born out of a winter season. Pastor Tom Asbury, who started this church after 35 years of marriage, went through a terrible divorce. His wife left him. It was an awful, awful disaster. He was a pastor at the time. He had to step down from being a pastor. Some big counseling. Another person had to take over the church. Walk through this whole process. And some of you know that if you go through a divorce, something like that, especially in more conservative, unfortunately, in more conservative churches, if, you're, if you've got a divorce on your record, you're kind of a second-class citizen. There's, you can come to those churches, but there's a bar on how high you can go. Like, you can... You can do this much ministry, but that's sort of it. You're done there. And Tom had a long winter season of his life where he wanted to be serving God and wanted to be doing stuff, but found himself sort of excluded out of a lot of that. But in that winter season, he began to pray. He began to make some plans. The Lord was preparing him for the next, and it turned out to be the final chapter of his life. Before he died, he said that because Pastor Tom started, before he went home to be with the Lord, he started, uh, I think, four different churches. All four still exist to this day. Before he died, he said that this church was without question the one he was the proudest of starting. But it came after a winter season. He'd been so busy for so long, there was some purpose in that winter season. Some barrenness, but some time to be quiet and to plan and to prepare and to pray, to rest for that final stretch. 
I went through some of this just through the pandemic where instead of adding ministries to church, we were taking them away. Volunteer base cut in half. Children's ministry workers cut in half. And so many things that was just like, that's not the direction you want to see things go in church. Those Sundays when it was just the pastors and me here preaching, it's weird. But we took some of that time to pray and to plan. Some of those things were just now starting to see the fruit of that. Much of what we do with my daughter Evangeline feels like winter. So much of the work that we put into her, it's not clear anything's ever going to come of it. There's just many things she just may not ever be, be capable of. Spring. Spring is a busy time. It's hopeful. It's hard, though. Spring is, there's so much to do after the winter, after the fall starts to come. Now you went from having nothing to do to everything to do. And by the way, it all needs to be done right now. Really, you should have been on this yesterday. Y'all have a spring season in your life ever? You go through one of those? where it all needed to be done yesterday. But it's not bad because it's still kind of hopeful. You're starting new things. We're, we're getting into new stuff. We're like, oh, we're going to do this and oh, we're going to do that. And here's this opportunity. And it's busy and it's hard, but it's hopeful. And there's just a lot going on in spring. Here's the advice. Don't be lazy. <laughs> Seize the opportunities. If you're in a spring season in your life, there's opportunities everywhere and they all need your attention, but that's okay. Go get it. Now's the time. Strike while the iron's hot. It's spring. Go. Patiently invest your time and your resources. You got to invest, invest, invest in the spring. The payday doesn't come in spring. Spring's for investing. I think about this with raising kids. You're in the process of raising kids. You've done it. Um, we're doing it right now. Raising kids is like, it's like spring all the time. Invest, invest, invest. When are you going to get a job and contribute around here? Oh, not yet. Okay. Invest, invest, invest. Right? You, you understand what I'm saying to you? There are seasons where you're just pouring out. You're investing, 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 investing. But payday is coming. I, had, I sat and had this long conversation with Hugo the other day about creation versus the Big Bang and where black holes fit into that and distant starlight. And I kid you not, this kid is five. But he's got these questions and we're talking about it. But I believe payday is coming someday on all that. We're launching new ministries. It's busy. Part of the reason I've been exhausted is we're doing all that. A lot of what we do with Evangeline is spring. Because we hope that she will be able to use a toilet herself. And so we're investing in it. We have been for years. But we're committed to it. That she'll be able to wear headphones. That she'll be able to manage her seizures. We're working on it. Spring, it's exhausting, but we're hopeful about it. So we're investing. Summer. Summer's exciting, but it's exhausting. Summer, summer, because like in spring, it's all new. In spring, it's opportunities here and there, and, and we're going 100 miles an hour, but we're all filled with spit and vinegar about it. And by the time you hit summer, you're out of both because you've been doing it for a while now. And it's hot out. And there's still no harvest. And you're still doing the things that you were doing back in the spring, back when it was a little cooler. And now it's hot and you're still doing it and you're still going and still pushing. And it's getting close. You can start to see things come up. It's like, oh, there's a little progress there. Oh, I can see it. I, I think it's going to be a good crop or the, the back 40 is looking like this or the apples are coming in really good. And you can kind of see it. But boy, is it hot out. Don't faint in the heat. Summer's when it all ripens. Summer's valuable. You got to patiently continue to labor. You got to see things through. This is, the Lord really spoke to my heart about this one this week. 
I had been sharing with you that I need to get rest. I, I, I've, God's given me conviction about getting some rest. And uh, on Friday, so two days ago, I was supposed to be my day off, and I failed again at taking a day off. I, I didn't, it didn't work. And, uh, and I was, by Friday night, so I, I was taking Evangeline out for a drive. We have to drive her around out in the country to get her to go to sleep at night. And so I was driving around. I was just, I was in a, I was in a, I was in a bad place on Friday night. I was kind of, my thoughts just sort of spiraling just down and just like, why am I even, because I get so discouraged. It's like I'm trying to take a day off and I just, I'm not doing it. And it feels like there are things that are out of my control. And I, and so I was just like, maybe I've misunderstood rest or I just, maybe I'm incapable of it. And I came home and I was so upset. I just went back to work. <laughs> And so I was in my office, it was like 10.30 at night, and I'm just working on stuff, just taking care of church business, which I'm not supposed to do on Fridays. My wife comes into the office, she's like, you better not be in here working. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I said, this is a paraphrase, but I said, rum, 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 rum. <laughs> what, I, what I said to my dear sweet wife. And she's so patient. She sat in there and we had a really good conversation. And the Lord started bringing up some of these scriptures, things I'm planning to tell you all. And she's telling me, and I was like, don't tell me that. That's my sermon you're preaching. <laughs> Here's the thing. What I realized is this. Rest is something that's important. It's a discipline that I need that I'm not good at. Maybe some of you, that's not the thing. You have something else, some other discipline that's your struggle. But just, if you would, just understand this one's mine. I'm not good at it. And I, I, we looked back through my, I have a day planner and everything I do is all these check boxes and everything goes in there. And every Friday for the last two months, there was a disaster or some big thing that happened. Every single Friday for two months that prevented me from taking time off. It's, that's why it's been two months since I took a day off. But there's been like real things. It's not like imaginary. It's not like I don't want to. I've been trying for real. I've been trying for two months and failing for two months. And I'm ready to quit. I said, it's, it's pointless to even try to take a day off because I'm never going to succeed at it. And it occurred to me that it's summer. That it's not time to quit trying. That I need to keep trying. That I need to keep at it. Because I, I believe God has genuinely convicted my heart about my need for this. So rather than abandon my conviction, I need patience. So you might be glad to know that I decided to try again. I'm going to try again this Friday to take a day off. And I'm going to keep trying until we figure it out. We came up, we came, and we're not just trying like banging our head into the wall. Heather and I came up with a couple really specific ideas of things to change about our schedule and about the way the date goes to try to make it so it could maybe work. And it may or may not work, but I'm going to keep trying. Where are you at? Do you have summer in your life somewhere? Something you've been working at it. You've been trying, but there's no harvest yet. You don't feel like you've gotten to the victory yet. And you're getting tired. You feel like you're burning up out there in the heat. Don't quit. Summer's when things ripen. Harvest. Ooh. Harvest is thrilling. Harvest is the point. Harvest is what we're after. Payday finally arrives. Harvest, you got to patiently work to bring it in, but the harvest is a time to celebrate. Here's what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Endurance, here's a good quote. Endurance is applauded at the finish line. That's where all the people wait and clap. But the middle miles of plugging away is where the progress is made. You don't win the race on the last hundred feet across the finish line. The race gets won in the middle miles where you keep at it, where there's no crowd, where there's no applause, where there's no trophy. You keep at it there, and then the reward is waiting at the end. So, you grow patience by valuing each season differently. That was super long, but it's because your pastor got traumatized by it this week. I'm sorry about that. I hope that was helpful to you. We'll do these next points very quickly. You grow patience by expecting the harvest at the end. Are you expecting the harvest? Not hoping for it, not guessing at it, expecting it. Are you expecting the harvest? You can. Hebrews 12 puts it like this. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience 
the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Don't quit before the harvest arrives. Expect the harvest is coming. I know winter's hard, but harvest is coming. I know spring is busy and hard, but harvest is coming. I know summer makes you want to faint, but the harvest is coming. Don't get so weary that you quit in the wrong season. What do you do when weariness threatens to overwhelm your patience and it's weariness is the problem? The Bible says, lest you be weary in your minds. The weariness is what overthrows our patience, I think. It's what overthrows mine. I, I stop being patient because I'm, I'm tired of the battle. I'm tired of investing without seeing any results. I'm tired of pushing and feeling like I'm not getting anywhere. I'm tired of failing over and over again. I'm just, I'm weary of it. What do we do when weariness threatens to overwhelm our patience? Two things. First, consider the example of Jesus Christ. Are you glad that Jesus didn't quit halfway to Calvary? Are you glad that he didn't quit after he was rejected by his own people? Are you glad that he didn't quit after he was betrayed by one of his closest friends? Are you glad that he didn't quit when his closest circle turned on him and denied that they even knew him? Are you glad he didn't quit when they brought in false witnesses and they lied about him in front of all the crowds of people? Are you glad he didn't quit when they pushed a crown of thorns into his head and when they whipped his back with rods and they put a robe on him and mocked him and spit on him and struck him in the face? Are you glad he didn't quit? Are you glad he didn't quit when he carried that crossbeam up a hill called Golgotha and they nailed his hands and feet into the board. And when he could have called down 10,000 angels and been released from it immediately, are you glad he didn't quit? Amen. Consider his example when you want to quit. And consider the prize at the end. Why did you start in the first place? I had to remember why I was even bothering trying to get some rest into my schedule. Because I was saying things to my wife like, you know, I just feel better when I'm productive. And there's, you can psychoanalyze that later if you want to, what that says about me. <laughs> it's probably a gold mine. <laughs> I just feel better when I've been productive. If I haven't done anything, if I haven't accomplished anything, I feel kind of blah. And rest, to me, kind of feels like that. Like, what did I do with my day? I wish I'd have done something. And so I have to remember why I started. What's the harvest I'm looking for? I'll tell you what the harvest is. The harvest is that I don't burn out as a pastor. Pastors burn out all the time. I've thought about, that's a ditch I don't want to go into, is burned out or bitter, or mean, or angry pastor, because he's so tired, he's never had a break in years, and so now he's just up here just kicking people and hitting them with his King James Bible. I don't want to be that guy. I know that. I also know that I want to finish as the pastor of Spokane Baptist Church. I've seen what it looks like. I want that. That's why I need to rest. It's not because I enjoy it. Maybe someday I'll enjoy it. That'd be cool. But that's not why I started. There's a harvest at the end. And so I'm after it because of the harvest. Je the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What's the joy that's set in front of you? Final point. So we grow patience by expecting the harvest at the end, but finally we grow patience by depending on Christ for strength. This is not a message where I tell you to try harder. This is a message where I tell you, if you want to grow patience, because it's only grown in trials, you're going to need Christ's strength for it. I think that's the reason God doesn't grow his patience on the mountaintop. Because then, in some weird way, we'd rely on our own patience. And Heather and I have fallen into that trap with evangeline. We, sometimes things will just go terribly, terribly wrong. And we just think to ourselves, we can get through this. We are the Navy SEALs of dealing with special needs life. I'm not trying to brag. 
I'm telling you the way it is. We're really good at it. My parents sometimes be like, why are you doing this? Like, you need help. And we're slow to get help. We're slow to ask for help because we can handle it because we're good at it. But that eventually fails. No matter how tough you are, no matter how strong you are, eventually you will find the end of that rope. And that's okay. Because there's somebody waiting at the end there for you. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he never, never runs out of strength. Colossians 1.11, I love this verse. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience. <laughs> I don't know how you expected that sentence to end. When I think about being strengthened with all might by God's glorious power unto, I'm thinking miracles. Unto taking over kingdoms and parting oceans. And, but no, the strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto patience. Because that's harder than parting the Red Sea. <laughs> And all patience and all long-suffering with joyfulness. Here it is. If you attempt to have patience in your own strength, it will be miserable. And then you're going to fail anyway. Maybe you've tried that. Some of you are nodding. Your pastor's tried it. I haven't even entirely given up on it yet. <laughs> I think I might try it again once or twice just to double check. <laughs> but here's the end of the story. If you try in your own strength, you will be miserable. And then probably fail anyway. And you'll just be miserable until you get there. I have another alternative for you. Rely on Christ's strength. It's God's design that we go through each season with joy. God's design is not that there's just joy at the harvest. If you'll rely on Christ for his strength, guess what? There's joy in winter. If you rely on Christ's strength, there's joy in the spring. If we rely on Christ's strength, there's joy even in those hot summer months. If we rely on Christ's strength, of course, there is joy at the winter. So patiently wait for Jesus to keep his promises. Sister Nancy, if you're able to come and just every head bow and every eye close and just for a moment. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward or do anything like that. But I would like to ask you here at the end of the message, if you would, for just a moment, to take a minute between you and the Lord, to have a, have a moment here to talk to the Lord. Here's what I'd like to ask you about. What season are you in? What season are you in? It's possible there's somebody who's here this morning that is, God's talking to you about, about knowing him. We, we talked a lot about Jesus this morning. And he's the answer to all this. What are, but do, do you know him? I mean, not just about him, but you know him. The race that we're, we've been talking about this morning doesn't start until you're a Christian. Salvation is not based on your, how well you run your race. It's not based on works at all. If you want to be saved from death and saved from hell, that can only be done by faith in Jesus Christ. So if you're unsure this morning about where you stand with God, if you're unsure of where you stand with God. Would you please let us take a Bible and we'll show you right from the Bible how you can know for sure that your sins have been forgiven, that you're right with God. If you're saved this morning, how are you running your race? How are you running it? How's it going? Are you running with the end in mind? Do you know, you know what the prize looks like? Do you know what the pitfalls look like? Do you have a vision for what the end looks like? If you've got those prizes in mind, are you running with temperance? Have you figured out what things you need to be diligent about to get there? If you're going to finish your race with joy. And finally now, are you running with patience? You say, yeah, pastor, I know at the end, I, I, I've thought about it. I have a vision, I think, from the Lord of what the joy looks like at the end. And I, and I know the things I need to diligently be doing to get there. I, I've got that. 
But maybe sometimes you get weary. Maybe that's the thing this morning the Lord spoke to your heart about. It's just not fainting at whatever those things you have made commitments to be diligent about. About not being swerved from that purpose and loyalty. If you're here this morning and you're in a winter season, don't be discouraged. Jesus has joy for you in that winter season as you rely on him for strength. Maybe you're in a spring season and you're excited about stuff, but boy, you're busy and it's going hard. Seize those opportunities. Spring is a, it's a short window of time. You've got to grab that while you can. Maybe you're here this morning and it's summer and you're ready to wilt in the heat. You've been at it and you're tired. Don't faint. Jesus has joy for you as you rely on him for strength. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we'll reap if we faint not.